So read, 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 suck on the block, read, read, sitting in the box, read, 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 Great Reads, our special episode. This is a bit of an extended episode. Uh, this week's Great Read is on a subject rather than a single author. And it's one of my favourite subjects in the world. It is the Haitian Revolution, a subject that I've been studying for many, many years. Um, which I was exposed to at Pan-African Saturday School. But big up my teacher, Basil Mohammed from Ackland Burley. Um, he played us. We used to have an extracurricular uh, African-Caribbean history class at my school. And um, we used to go there Friday after school. And one Friday he played us this tape and it was a recording of a dude reading an account of the Haitian Revolution. And um, it was an emotional experience. I remember it to this day. I must have been about 13 at this point. An outreach project, which it was what it was called, was called at my school, was an amazing, uh, an amazing facility, an amazing experience, an amazing place to go. But it was a place that a lot of the black students at the school who went negotiated with in the sense that some of us were diehards, like I went most weeks, a couple other men went most weeks, but then you had a couple other men that weren't every week. And one of, one of my bridgens, who was a couple years older than me in school, um, he was known as a little bit of a rude boy in the school, in, in, in a sense. Um, not that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't always the best behaved, but I was known to be more like kind of in, in, in my studies. And I was a couple years younger, he was one of the oldest. And yeah, anyway, he was there. I don't know why I remember that. And his dad came. And his dad was a man from the ends that we all knew as well. And for some reason, I just remember that particular week because they played this tape on the narrative of the, Haitian, of the Haitian Revolution. And his pops, who was an older man, maybe in his 40s or 50s, just cried. Like, cried at the end of the story. It was something he never knew. He'd got to almost 50 years old in his life. And I suppose as a, he, he was Jamaican, his dad, but he'd internalized the idea. And I don't think he even realized the, the mainstream idea in this country that basically, you know, black people sat down and took it, essentially. We got enslaved and, you know, there was a little minor rebellion, skirmish here or there. But for the most part, we waited for William Wilberforce to come along and set us free, which is essentially what I was taught in mainstream school, but not in the outreach project. So for those who don't know, between 1791 and 1804 in Haiti, which was called Saint-Domingue at the time, it was a French colony. It was one of, if not the most profitable colony in the world at the time. I say one of, if not the most, because there's a debate about it. Uh, between different economic scholars about the accuracy of that statement at the moment. But it produced uh, between half and 80% of all Europe's sugar, about 40% of all Europe's coffee. It was the centerpiece of the transatlantic slave system. Between 1791 and 1804, the only successful slave revolution in the history of humanity and all the millennia of slavery, from the slavery of the Abbasids and the Ottomans to the different forms of forced servitude within Europe and Greece and Rome and every, pretty much every empire on this, on if human societies had some form of forced servitude. Not every empire has had chattel slavery, and certainly not every empire has had race-based, industrial-scale chattel slavery. Um, so we can be specific even when talking about different forms of labor exploitation. But only once in all of that history of slavery um, have the enslaved people rebelled against their oppressors, overthrown their oppressors, and become the government themselves. So between 1791 and 1804, the enslaved Africans of Haiti defeated France, Britain, and Spain at war, three largest empires of the time, then had a civil war among themselves between what is loosely termed the blacks and the mulattoes, but that obscures more complex realities because many mulattoes fought in the black army and many blacks fought in the mulatto army, but colorism was certainly a key uh, determinant of Haitian history in the period. For those who are not familiar with the period, you had a set of rules called the Code Noir, which became more severe toward the end of the 1800s, in which so-called uh, people of color or free people of color, um, two thirds of whom, or more than two thirds of whom were mulatto of some form of mix, were legislated against, even though they were free and they were allowed to own slaves, which many of them did, they weren't allowed to quote unquote dress like white people, whatever that means, by law. They weren't allowed to dance. They had all kinds of stupid and humiliating uh, racist rules which meant that even though they were free and some of them were wealthy they had less legal personality than the poor whites or the petty blancs that were on the island at the time um, and so this cauldron of having roughly 50,000 between 30 and 50,000 uh, whites between 30 and 50,000 people of color so roughly similar numbers slightly less quote unquote free people of color and half a million enslaved Africans led to the largest slave rebellion that then became a slave revolution. Incredibly well organized. We know now that when the, when the rebellion first kicked off on August the 22nd, um, that 
we know now the planned date was the 24th because the entire government, so August the 22nd, 1791, the entire government was planning to meet on the 25th. So the original date was the 24th. The enslaved Africans who'd managed to coordinate thousands of people who spoke different languages, who came from all different regions of Africa, weren't one big black happy family, the way that you know historians talk about black people sold their own people as if all of Africa was just one big black mass. Um, they don't deal with the complications of the different African kingdoms and rivalries and societies and various different histories and linguistic struggles, um, linguistic differences that informed uh, some of those differences and view of difference, but we won't get into all of that today. That's a different lecture for another day. Um, but it's really miraculous when you think about it, that all of these people, often from places that were thousands of miles apart, um, managed to coordinate this rebellion and eventually lead to the defeat of the three largest empires of, the t of their day and declare themselves independent and abolish slavery. Before Britain abolished the slave trade, which Britain abolished in 1807, and slavery was not abolished in Britain's Caribbean colonies until 1834. Um, so Haiti became one of the pioneer abolitionists. They then allowed any African from other islands that would reach Haiti to be free. They helped give Simon Boulevard the money to quote unquote liberate South America. There were loads of other massive impl Im implications of the Haitian Revolution. It led to the Louisiana Purchase, um, which um, again, look that up if you don't know what it is. So many massive implications. It challenged for the first time for many people. One of the interesting books that I've got in my pile, and I know I'm waffling on, is a book called Facing Racial Revolution. That was one of the books I used to prep my lectures. I, I lecture a bit on this subject. Um, and Facing Racial Revolution is the testimonies of the French victims, if you can call them that, of the uprising, talking about the rebellion. And one of the fascinating things about the tone of a lot of the French uh, witnesses is this kind of bemused tone of we can't believe these people are rebelling against us we treat our slaves so well apart from the you know the torture and the slavery and the buying and selling of kids and the mutilation and the rape and all the torture that we know occurred but then there's this sense of there was also this tone of there must be some white leaders behind it there's no way africans dumb niggers could have possibly coordinated this this is the tone of a lot, a lot of the french witnesses at the time and this is part of what would uh, would, would screw them over if they would have made peace if they'd have reformed slavery many of the during the rebellion there were many stages where the enslaved africans just demanded let's pay us for our work we want three days off and we want to be paid for our work and we want you to abolish torture we basically want to be treated like employees and actually we'll go back on the plantations and work on those conditions that, that deal was offered several times but in their kind of racist arrogance the french planters human traffickers on the island refused and then they got their ass whipped and many of them got killed. Interestingly, many of them that managed to escape the island went to America. The southern states of America, and of course, having been victims of racial revolution or been victims of a rebellion against slavery in the Caribbean, they actually kind of made America even more racist, if we can say that. So they took their attitudes and their experience of seeing firsthand a slave uprising uh, to America and kind of reinforced and strengthened the plantation system in the American South as French expatriates uh, to what was at the time French Louisiana and eventually became part of America. So all of these different threads were going on. It challenged for the first time in the early modern world a lot of people's conception, Europeans' conception of innate white superiority. Because at the time European armies and militaries were feeling themselves, they colonized most of the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, they were, they were on their stuff. They felt invincible at this point. And it wasn't really until a century later with the Sino-Russian War, um, when the Japanese defeated the Russians, that again a war would happen that would call into question this idea of innate white superiority. And it was almost like an uh, existential crisis that Europeans had, that they'd lost a war to savage Africans uh, who were former slaves, much less. Um, and, and so it's really impossible to overstate the importance and the implications of the Haitian Revolution, particularly for the freedom of people of Caribbean heritage and the freedom of black people everywhere, but also its democratic implications. What could be more democratic than getting rid of the worst form of undemocratic government, a slave society? Yet it's never spoken about in those terms. Um, the first society to attempt a multiracial democracy. The whites that fought with the revolution, namely the Polish and the Germans, that stayed behind in 1804. All the French were massacred, but those whites that fought with the revolution, stayed behind, were treated as Haitian citizens afterwards. And it says so expressly in the constitution. So in many ways, ha Haiti was democratically further ahead than countries that claim to have pioneered democracy, because Haiti is still poor today, and we can do another lecture about why that is the case at another time. Because it still has problems, including its own corrupt elite, which every society in the world seems to have. 
um, Haiti's contribution to modern democracy has been massively obscured and it's incumbent upon us that claim to believe in justice to undo some of the intellectual dishonesty. Here's a good collection of books to start with. That was the longest intro ever, but it is a Haitian Revolution special, great reads. So I'm gonna race through, I've got eight books here, eight of the key texts that I've looked at to prepare for my lectures on the Haitian Revolution. Um, the first two are by a scholar called David Gegus, who's very thorough, got a lot of knowledge in the archives. I don't like his tone sometimes. He tries to play kind of objective, but sometimes passes moral judgment. So for example, in the intro to this book, he calls Dessaline grimly energetic, and he calls another one of the enslaved African rebels, I can't remember the exact word, I was trying to find the, because I've got my notes in here, I was trying to find uh, that piece now that I was thinking about it. But another adjective that basically means, you know, grim or brutal. Um, but it's interesting, because when he talks about Napoleon, even though Napoleon was obviously brutal, or Leclerc or others, he doesn't call them brutal, he doesn't attach adjectives to them, they're just individual Frenchmen. So even though he's a scholar of the Haitian Revolution, and a very brilliant and thorough scholar, I still feel a little bit like he talks about uh, horrific atrocities on all sides. How can the atrocities of an enslaved population ever compare to the atrocities of the enslavers? To me, they just can't. But anyway, nonetheless, an indispensable scholar. This is a documentary history which has the actual documents uh, from the time. The archives in Haiti itself were, off, uh, were burnt down repeatedly, so most of the archives come from France and Spain and Britain and elsewhere and um, letters of different groups of people. Documentary history, David Gegus. The other uh, David Gegus book that I used to prep my lectures on the Haitian Revolution is this one here, Haitian Revolutionary Studies, which looks at some of the key questions in the Haitian uh, Revolution. Again, little notes that I've made in there, but it looks at uh, significant chapters. So, for example, one of the things it looks at is the Haitian Revolution as a whole. It looks at what we call Toussaint Louverture's vault face. Why did Toussaint Louverture suddenly, in 1793, 1794, switch allegiance from the Spanish to the French. Looks at some of these big questions. It looks at a really interesting character called Jean Quina. Jean Quina was a formerly enslaved African who spent his entire life fighting for the maintenance of slavery and white supremacy because history is much more complicated merely than the color of a person's skin. So it looks at an interesting character like that also, Haitian Revolutionary Studies. Uh, this next one here, Toussaint Louverture and the American Civil War, the promise and peril of a second Haitian Revolution by Matthew J. Calvin looks exactly and specifically at what you would think. The impact of the Haitian Revolution and more specifically the idea that has surrounded the individual person of Toussaint Louverture on the American Civil War. How abolitionists, particularly people like John Brown, if you don't know who John Brown is, look him up, um, use the Haitian Revolution as a source of inspiration uh, for abolitionists and even violent abolitionists. I'm not sure that abolitionism can be called violent, revolutionary abolitionists. Um, people who said that the armed overthrow of slavery was, was, was appropriate at this point in American history. Those people looked at the Haitian Revolution for a source of inspiration and to the government of Toussaint Louverture as an individual. On the other side, people who wanted to maintain slavery looked at their fear of the Haitian Revolution, that the Haitian Revolution would be repeated and all of the violence against uh, white and other slave masters, because it wasn't only though the majority of the slave owners were white, not only uh, whites weren't the only slave owners, people of color, including some former slaves, chose to become part of the plantation system and own slaves themselves. The Africans didn't spare them, they often killed them when they were caught. And some, like I said, quote unquote, people of color fought in their armies to maintain slavery, a minority, just as a minority of the white population in racialized slavery fought in the revolutionary army. So things were very, very complex. But this looks at specifically people like Wendell Phillips, who was an abolitionist who can continually talked about Toussaint Louverture, um, and gave speeches that were very impactful on the eve of the American Civil War. Um, the next one, Beyond the Slave Narrative, Politics, Sex and Manuscripts in the Haitian Revolution by Deborah Jensen, one of my favourite books on the Haitian Revolution, brilliant book, looks at the poems and poetry, Creole poetry that came out in Haiti around the period of the revolution and at the letters left by different leaders in the Haitian Revolution, Dessaline, Toussaint Louverture, etc., Christophe, as literature as a body of literature and examines them as a body of philosophical, early black nationalist, anti-colonial literature. Really fantastic book, deeply philosophical. Wouldn't recommend it as a starting point though. This is a book you read if you've already got kind of a grip on the basic facts of the Haitian Revolution, in my opinion. Um, the next one is the first account written by a Haitian himself. Baron de Vatsi was a member of uh, Henry Christophe's government, the, uh, the government that took over um, when the country split again um, post-1806, when Jean-Jacques Dessalines was uh, executed. And 
as you can see, the Colonial System Unveiled. It's right there in the title. This is probably the first book we know of that anticipates Franz Fanon and others. Um, written, I think, what was the date? Well, he died in 1820, so I think this was written in 1814, 15, can't find the date. But it was written shortly after the revolution. Um, the author died in 1820, so it was a very early account of the revolution. And enormous atrocities that it speaks of during the period, but really examines colonialism as a system and may be the first book in history to do so, certainly in the history of the Atlantic colonial slave system. Speaking of which, the first account of the revolution in English was written by Marcus Rainsford, who was a member of the British Army in Haiti, who wrote a very sympathetic account, actually, of the revolution against the French. He plays down Britain's role in trying to reinstall slavery on the island, obviously, um, and he sort of, it seems that he skewed some historical facts and even the dates of his own presence on the island, because Britain's uh, invasion of the island was expressly to reinstall slavery and take the island from the French during a brief period in which the French had abolished slavery, only for them to attempt to reinstall it later. But again, great book, really well written, first account of the revolution in English, written I think as early as 1805. Yes, originally published in 1805, very, very good book, um, highly recommend it. My final two are the best books, general accounts of the Haitian revolution, in my humble opinion. Uh, very few of you will be surprised by the first one, those of you who are familiar with the Haitian Revolution I'm going to bring in, and that is The Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James, which for a long time has become the standard and the main text uh, through which the Haitian Revolution is studied. Um, still a brilliant book, incredibly well written, very polemic, great scholarship, but like any history book written 70-something years ago, it was written in the 1930s, so maybe 80-something years ago, how's my maths these days? I used to be good at maths once upon a time. Um, it has some historical errors now, this is about the fifth copy of the book I've Owned. In fact, I haven't actually read this physical copy because the copies I've read were so heavily annotated and used that the pages have fallen out and were brutalised. It's a book I've read back to back many times. I think it has some shortcomings. Some people will be upset by me saying this. Um, but C.R. James had a political evolution and at the early part of his career, he hadn't yet arrived. A, he didn't have the knowledge of Africa that we have today, so pre-colonial African civilization, And that covered or, or, or clouded some of the judgments he made of African society, snap judgments he made, um, like anyone born in the 1930s, access to accurate information about Africa was much more difficult to come by. He was also at a point in his career when he wrote this book that he referred to Marcus Garvey's uh, black pan-Africanism as pitiable rubbish. So that gives a sense of even though he was committed to anti-colonialism, uh, he hadn't yet arrived where he arrived later in his career, where he saw that black nationalism, progressive black nationalism, was not contradictory to class politics. And in fact, there was a way to navigate the two. One didn't necessarily negate the other. And also learning more about Africa, he realized Garvey, who also didn't have the access to the information that we have today about African history, but Garvey was ahead of the curve many ways in centering Africa, even though he never got to visit, in the consciousness of the people of African heritage outside the Americas. Nonetheless, an incredibly brilliant book undeniably magnificent contribution to scholarship. C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins, is the second to last book in this Haitian Revolution special that we're going to look at. The final book in the series, which I think is probably the most complete account in English now, I would recommend as a strong compliment to C.L.R. James's one, um, is Avengers of the New World by Laurent Dubois. Um, I believe he's from Duke University. Um, I feel that this is a, the most up-to-date, correct some of the... Uh, misconceptions and, and scholarly problems that have gone before, um, gives a really incredibly well researched, but not just well researched, so well written it reads almost like a novel, like incredibly well written narrative of the Haitian Revolution, um, richly detailed, really gives you almost a sense of what it was like, kind of how it smelt and tasted. And even though he is a you know scholar from America, an elite university, manages to avoid kind of a judgmental tone, really centers without being romantic and, and without, you know, romanticizing um, any of the rebels, really centers Haiti's contribution to the modern world that has been deliberately obscured and played down and underdeveloped. So a really, really fantastic book, one of the key books on the Haitian Revolution. Um, in my view, could would I dare to say the best single volume account in English now over and above CLR James's? Mm, I did kind of say that still, but um, people weren't happy with me. But um, I would recommend you read it and decide for yourself. But if someone was going to start in the Haitian Revolution in English, because I'm sure there's loads of texts in French um, written by Haitian authors that I don't yet have access to, I'm not aware of, that have been translated, that are probably better. Um, 
but this currently I would rank as maybe, dare I say it, the best single volume history in English of the many, many books on the Asian Revolution that I've read. Um, with C.L.R. James is probably more legendary and the greater impact of a book because of how long ago it was it was written. Um, but Laurent Dubois' Avengers of the New World is our final book in this Haitian Revolution special. Um, yeah, so this is a Carla. Uh, this week's Great Reads was a Haitian Revolution special. Check it out, big up. Um, I've done a few lectures on the Haitian Revolution of late and I will be posting a full length, uh, well, snippets and then the full length of those uh, lectures online, but wanted to give you a review of just a couple, you know, a few of the key texts that over the years have, have informed uh, the information I've collected around this subject. Big up! So read, 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 suck on the block, read, read, sitting in the box, read, read, read.